Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours. My name is Simon Treen and I want to ask 1,000 lawyers, that's people in Leeds or from Leeds, over this decade, the second question that everybody asks everybody. What do you do? So, if you're in Leeds or from Leeds, then be my guest, Leeds. Email workinghourspod at western-studios.com with a short bio and some ideas about your availability. You can appear as yourself or anonymously on the show and you will have approval over what gets published from our chat. Welcome to episode 15. My guest this episode is Gloria Kimberly, interviewed over Skype on the 30th of March 2021. Gloria is the project leader of the Leeds Festival of Kindness, Compassion and Wellbeing, which first took place in September 2020. The aim of the festival is to spread kindness and compassion in the city of Leeds, thereby improving everyone's well-being. Gloria is also a holistic health and wellness coach who supports people in improving their health and well-being and is the host of a podcast called Sharing the Vibe. The link for that is in the show notes. This was a two-hour chat, one of three from this year so far. The whole interview is going to be available on Patreon for anyone who subscribes to here. I think it's a really good example to let you hear the raw footage from. So if you're interested in what I'm trying to do here, sling us a quid on Patreon and go have a listen to it. FYI, it's not a priority for me to put that up there because there are no patrons as yet. But if I do get one, then that will necessitate me having to sort that out as soon as possible. This is the penultimate interview from this year so far, so if I don't get any further guests before the next episode, I will be pausing this year's volume after episode 16 next Monday, until I have at least another half dozen or so interviews to put out there. I don't want to do that, I want to put out two shows a week eventually, but one does only what one is allowed to. So if you're a lawyer listening to this and you think you would be able to answer questions that you already know all the answers to, then please get in touch to arrange a time for us to do that. Email workinghourspod at western-studios.com. Also, drop me a line if you have any queries or feedback, complaints or compliments. If you happen to hear this on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a review. I'd ask for five stars, but as I wouldn't rate me that yet, I'd be very surprised to see anyone else do it. But, you know, cheers anyway if you do. I will get up to being a five-star show at some point this decade, at least for lawyers anyway. Before this show properly starts to hit its stride, which I think will be around three dozen or so episodes in, I want to just let you know my own list of complaints that I have with my own show. So, slagging yourself off, self-own, let's go. First off, the music is wrong. I'm not dissing the tune, it's just not the vibe that I want for this show. It needs to change and I'm working on that. Second, I hate my intros. I don't know where to pitch them. It's not just a be yourself situation. It's a very contrived circumstance and I don't know who, if anyone, I am addressing in them. Thus, I don't really have a confident sense of how they should go yet, which is why I feel they're a bit dull and a bit crap, at least to me. I don't want to put too much of me in these either. I want the interviews themselves to have an element of discovery to them so that listeners can really build their own pictures of the individuals I'm speaking with. I don't have a problem with any interviewees. I think they're all brilliant and interesting so far. Thanks to all my guests, by the way. Not sure I've said that on the show. I know that this show is inherently interesting, that I have a unique angle on an interview-based podcast with a specific focused and local goal. I know I'm looking at a universal subject, work, in a highly particular way, through the eyes and experiences of my fellow lawyers. You do this show in London with a name presenter and you'll have a hit podcast. Do it up north with a nobody and you get, well, tumbleweeds. Anyway, that's enough screaming into the void for now. Let's get into this. What did you want to be when you grew up? So I was just thinking about this. um, And funnily enough, I think one of the first things I wanted to be was a reporter. My mother says Mm. that I wanted to be a reporter. And I'm not really sure why. I was always interested in the news when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. And then I think that evolved into being a gymnast, <laughs> yeah. very practical career choice because Nadia Comaneci was, you know, big at the time and I took yeah. up gymnastics and used to do that. So those were my kind of, you know, what I wanted to be, neither of which came true, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you do any gymnastics then for a while or anything? I did for a while. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it, it was, it was more a hobby than anything. I think she just captured, you know, a lot of people's imaginations a lot of girls growing up at that time and I don't know what it was about her she was young she was fresh you know she got perfect score she got perfect scores yeah (laughs) so so there was something about that but yes that was probably one of the first things I wanted to be very good so what is it that you do now 
So now I do a few different things. So I am kind of my my first job, I would say, is I'm a holistic health and well-being coach. So I support a wellness coach. I support people in improving their physical and emotional health. Um, out of that came the opportunity to be the project leader of the Leeds Festival of Kindness, Compassion and Well-Being. So that's that was a very exciting move because it suddenly gave me the opportunity to share my message about self-care and, and kindness to a, many more people. It gave me kind of a platform to share that. So it was one of those things that everything sort of came together, you know, met the right people at the right time. And they asked me to lead that project. And that's been wonderful because I've met some brilliant people and learned so much about Leeds as a city because of that. And then on the side, my husband and I do some property investments. So we create houses for, you know, we, we develop houses and we rent them out um, yeah. and we do that in a really positive way. You know, again, I, I want to walk my talk and practice what I preach. I can't remember which of the websites. So it was either on the kindness website or your website. It may have been both where you were saying, you know, sort of uh, walking the talk. Yeah. Um, so how did you get into the the I mean, how would you describe yourself overall, like that, as a holistic pr practitioner or as a wellness coach, or how how would you put it? Yeah, it's um, I think holistic practitioner probably because it me all the things I do for me it, it all fits together. So it may seem very disparate, but actually to me it all fits together. So it's back to that holistic idea. Um, but there, I haven't come up with the perfect job title for what I do. So that's probably the closest thing I'd say. Did you train in Leeds from that? Are you from Leeds originally? I can detect a bit yeah. of a North American accent in there. Yes. So I'm originally from New York. I grew up in New York until I was 14. And my mother is Costa Rican. Both my parents are from Central America. Um, so my mother, my sister and I moved to Costa Rica when I was 14 and I did my high school years there. Right. And then um, found it really hard to adapt there, if, if I'm honest, you know, moving mm -hmm. at age 14, I think, you know, 14 is hard enough, never mind yep. moving countries and language and all the rest of it. Um, so as soon as I could, I went back to the States and did my university years there. And then I've been in the UK for 30 31 years it'll be this year so most of my adult life has actually been in the UK yeah and in Leeds for 19 of those years so quite a long time as well so were you when you originally came to the UK were you in London no totally no oh. no um my husband's family were in the northwest and so I I got to know it the UK really from that lens of the Northwest, which I think was really good, really positive because I was a bit of a novelty. Yeah. <laughs> People found me, you know, cause they just didn't really meet many Americans. So, you know, I was in a small <laughs> village and so I sort of stood out a little bit, which was nice. People, people were very, very friendly. You know, and then you go to London and because it's a big city and everybody's busy and everything, it's, you know, it's slightly different. And, and, you know, there are loads more Americans and everything else down there. Yeah. So. Yeah, you become invisible again. You know, whereas before you were a celebrity, and it's nice to have that sort of feeling of like, ooh, I got a bit of notoriety and special treatment because I'm a bit, I stand out here. Yeah, yeah, I think that was it was nice, and and people in the northwest were very, very friendly, very open, and I I found that really lovely actually. You said you were studying somewhere, is that right? What what did you study? What did you originally train for, and what sort of roles did you kind of get into initially? So my my degree is in international relations, and um, I guess it kind of links back to the sort of interested in the news, interested in in what was going on. You know, I've always mm. had sort of interest. I think my initial plan was I wanted to be a diplomat. I wanted to join, you know, join the State Department and represent the United States abroad. That was kind of my ideal thing, and to spend time in different countries. Mm -hmm the more I got into it and realized that I would be having to represent my government and I didn't agree with my government at that time. Mm. And then I found out about all sorts of things that had happened in the past that I really didn't agree with. I thought, yeah. actually, I don't want to do that. That doesn't sit right with me. Yeah. Um, so that then I thought, okay, well, maybe international business, that might be a way forward. And then I, I met my husband um, through his brother who was, who was in Washington at the time. And and then like my whole career path sort of changed because suddenly it was it was about 
giving an opportunity to that relationship. And mm -hmm. while England was never kind of on my radar, I ended up coming here to sort of see what life was like and to see if mm -hmm. I could live here. And it was it was good. And I felt I could live here. But then I said to my then boyfriend, you know, you need to come to the States and then we can decide where we where we will live. Mm -hmm. um, so we got married over there and then a year later decided to come and settle in the UK. So that's kind of how I ended up here. <laughs> up to meeting your partner, what kind of roles were you in at that point then? I was still I was still a student then, so just doing little jobs, you know, okay. in, you know, in terms of support jobs. And then once I met him and we we you know we came together, I had some corporate jobs. So I worked in a you know for a bank. Um, and then when I lived here, you know, we moved here, and I managed to get a job as a, a graduate um, trainee for a big U.S. what was then accountancy firm, but it was it was accountancy management consultant. So one of those big firms, it was a name I knew, and I guess they they related to my CV, because that's the other thing when you move countries, people look at your CV and they don't know what to do with it. It doesn't mean anything yeah. to them. Um, so they kind of could relate and we moved down south. So we did live down south for, for quite a few years and, you know, did that kind of London life, commuters life. You know, we were young, we, we took advantage of the city, we, you know, go to the theater, go out. Yeah. that sort of thing and then once you settle you know and have you know want to start a family and stuff that becomes less appealing yeah um and then and then it's like okay well what kind of quality of life do we want and and mm. then it was like okay we want to go back up north so that's you know so we were originally headed to the northwest and it just so happened that my husband got a job over here in yorkshire and um i'd been here before you know i had some friends who were up here and i kind of liked the area so Yep. That's how we ended up settling in Leeds. How did you eventually get into the wellness thing then? Did you did you train in it? Did you was it always a curiosity of yours? Were you always quite into sort of alternative therapies and and you know wellness, I suppose, overall? Yeah, so I I think I've always been very aware of looking after my health and my body. Um, and then because I had, um, you know, a corporate job and, you know, there was a lot of stress and associated with that, I started looking for alternatives um, to support me with that. And what, what was interesting is at one stage I wanted to do like a career change and I did this mind map, you know, the somebody was helping me with this, you know, they suggested doing a mind map. And there was this like one strand of the mind map that had to do because it was about things I was interested in. And it was about alternative therapies, just but not thinking that I could ever actually be in that space, practice in that space. But what ended up happening is I, I took my son, my eldest, to see a homeopath. Um, and I didn't know what homeopathy was. I had no idea, but I was looking for an alternative to help treat. He had a very mild case of asthma, and I, I, I just wasn't happy about him being on um, conventional medicine and you know it had been a while and they were saying oh he's going to be on it you know if, if he's lucky he'll grow out of it when he was seven and he was mm. three and I thought yeah I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about this so I, I found um, an alternate well not a complementary health clinic mm -hmm. but, you know above a shop you know a health food shop I used to go to and the homeopath happened to be there and I was looking at her leaflet and she said oh you know have a look at this and, and, and I said well could you help him and she said yes and so I took him and within three, you know, three months, we didn't need to use his um, inhaler anymore. You know, it just it just stopped the symptoms. And, and I thought, wow, this is amazing stuff. And then I started to go see her. You know, I was pregnant so that she she supported me during that during the pregnancy. And then we kind of just shifted our, you know, our health care more towards mm -hmm. that. So, so it was just, it was a kind of an opportunity. And then when we moved to Leeds, uh, I had to leave my job anyway. I was having my second child. I was trying to settle my family in a new city. You know, my son was start, my eldest was starting school. So I just took a break. And then that was seemed to be calling me that I needed to be in this space. So I trained as a homeopath. I took, I did a, an, an introductory year course, and then I did a four year diploma. Mm -hmm. And that really opened my eyes to an understanding of health that I think I always kind of had, but nobody had 
you know, I'd never, nobody had said, oh, this is, this is how health might be. But to me, it made absolute sense that, you know, things came from, there was a link to emotional stuff, that things came from the inside. You know, there was suddenly all these things, and I thought, oh, that makes absolute sense. Mm -hmm. So that's how I trained and got into it. And then as you, you know, develop your career, you start learning about other modalities and things. You experiment, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a huge believer in, you know, there's, there's something for everybody. So if one thing doesn't work for you or doesn't sit right, you know, then try something else or sometimes a practitioner might not be the right practitioner for you you know i'm not i'm not the right practitioner for everybody i know that mm -hmm. um so try a different practitioner you know that relationship is very important because you're opening yourself up to somebody you know in order for me to support somebody they really need to to open up and tell me mm -hmm. what's going on and i've been in a very kind of i think of I feel a very privileged position that a few people have said things to me that they said they, they've never said to anybody else. And they've been carrying mm -hmm. that, you know, and buried it, you know, yeah. deep inside themselves. And that that often is what causes physical discomfort or emotional discomfort. And that's what I'm looking to support them in terms of changing, to releasing that so that they don't need to carry that anymore. Yeah. I liked what, what you were saying on the website in terms of you know, treating the person and not just the symptoms. And I think, you know, as, as much as you sort of conventional Western medicine does, you know, they, they, they give you an amount of, oh, well, you know, are you all right? And, and you know, they're polite, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but it is very much focused on just give you this medicine. This is a mechanical thing that's wrong. Here's a mechanical fix for it. You know, and as you say, a lot of those symptoms, especially chronic illness, you know, it seems more and more that the more data they get on it, the more and more it's just these are things that you're building in yourself. Either they're from childhood development and they're issues that you're carrying over from there or they're from the stress of work and life and from, you know, sort of bad attitudes you've learned. Like, I've um, seen a couple of talks by, do you know, are you familiar with Gabor Mate? Yes. Yes, he's amazing. So he's great, isn't he? Um, so some of his stuff where he's talking about, you know, how people, when they they just learn bad behaviours with, say, something like anger, which should be just an outburst, and then they're kind of like, they're told not to be angry, so they get angry, but they don't express the anger, and then they hold it in, and you're holding all of that in for years and years and years, and it just compounds within the body, because all of these emotions, you know, they're, they're, they're biochemical as well, they're not just they don't come from the ether. The it, it's kind of, I suppose I, I see it as a bit analogous to you know the way we change sort of information signals. If you you send things on waves and they come into other things and they change into other things, it's it's a similar thing. Uh, but we very much see ourselves as independent, you know, biophysical beings that are separate from everything, and when we're not in any way. I mean, if you could see the air, you would know that. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I I do think it's very interesting, and I bet it's I bet it's really nice work in terms of, you know, working with people to kind of help them through things and seeing that progress. Um, I would imagine. So I'm guessing here that the frustrations would probably be when you kind of see clients and you can kind of see, I can really help this person, but they've kind of come to you not because you know they're, they're, they're it's a sort of last resort but they don't really believe in it because i suppose you you've got to have that you've got to have that relationship where they trust you to trust what you're saying so i, I mean it, on a day-to-day -day basis and sort of working with clients how how does that work is the majority of people that that see you they're all kind of coming to you because they really believe in it and they're you know generally trying to find the right practitioner how does it work on on a day-to-day -day? I think it, de it depends. I think some people, you know, it is kind of a last resort. So somebody might have, you know, mentioned it to them or mentioned me to them and they'll, they'll think, okay, well, I'll have a go. So I'm, I'm not about convincing anybody of anything. Like I, you know, if somebody comes to me and I've had clients come to me and say they, they want to work with, for example, Site K and not homeopathy, you know, and I've had people say to me, I'm a complete skeptic, I don't believe in homeopathy. And I'm like, that's cool, that's fine, we'll we'll work with, with Site K. 
um, which is a, a modality all about trying to help you shift limiting beliefs. So I've had that and then I'll be sitting there, you know, either on Zoom or with, with the client and feel like they could really do with a remedy. So I might suggest, look, I've had this feeling, you know, what do you think? But this probably wouldn't be in the first one or one, you know, first session or the second session, even if I know they're already not on board with that. But if it's a strong feeling, this is my intuition talking that they could do with something, I'll suggest it. And mm. if they close it down, then that's fine. You know, it's it's I'm just offering what, you know, the things I know. Sometimes I will suggest things that they can buy, you know, over the counter, like flower essences. I'm a huge fan of flower essences and you can buy Rescue Remedy, you know, from most places. And Rescue Remedy, what it does is it just kind of turns the volume down. So if you're having, you know, if you're really wound up or, or stressed out or, you know, it can just turn the volume down so that you're more able to, to, to get out of that space. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends on the person. Then other people will come to me for homeopathy and think like, hey, is the weirdest thing going? They don't want to know anything about it. And then over again, over time, it'll be like, well, you know, I think this would really benefit. Shall we have a go? Shall we shall we play? Shall we try it? Mm -hmm. um, but it is about trust, which is why I always suggest to people, you know, if they're shopping around for, for anything, whether it's a, you know, a, a, an acupuncturist or what have you, is speak to one or two people, look at their websites, get a feel for them. And then, you know, your intuition will should lead you to the right person, the person who can support you in the best way for you. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of, you know, it's back to the tailored medicine idea. And I think, I think the challenge, you know, that conventional medicine has is they don't really, the system isn't built to give people time. I think GPs would probably love to have a bit more time with people, but they've got 10 minutes. You know, I get an hour and a half in a first consultation with somebody. Yeah. So I can really dig and find out and give them space to talk and, you know, say what needs to be, you know, what, what they might need to say. And not everything can, will come out on a first on a first consultation, you know, particularly mm -hmm. if somebody's quite, you know, guarded or worried or or they didn't you know they weren't anticipating talking about that thing because that thing for them isn't related to whatever they're experiencing whatever physical symptoms they're experiencing so it's all about having that space that very mm. kind of sacred and safe space for people to talk and i think i think it, it would be very different perhaps if gps had a bit more space they might they might see that and they might mm. be to support people in a slightly different way, but the system doesn't really help them. Mm. So, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of the NHS. You know, I'm American. I come from a very different system of mm. healthcare. So I, I do believe in the NHS. The NHS has supported me when I've needed it, you know, during my pregnancies and giving birth and all that. Um, I just think, I, I think the system isn't helpful. And I think that, that you're right, that very mechanistic way of viewing the body isn't particularly helpful either. Mm. So, you know, if you're coming to me about, about your skin or about your arm, I'm going to ask you about all sorts of weird and wonderful things that don't seem to be related to your arm at all. But I'm yeah. painting a picture of who you are and what you might need. I think that's spot on. And I, I, I really liked your, your sort of highlighting of time there. Uh, I, I do think that's, you know, it's not something that, you know, it's one of those obvious things that, that you know, your brain just hasn't clicked. And then someone says it and you go, ah, yes. Because, the, yeah, that, that sort of process of, you know, you're waiting in the waiting room to be seen for sort of five minutes and they're kind of like, who are you? What, what What's wrong with you? Right. OK, I take this. Get out. And yeah, like you say, the people don't go into medicine to just dish out, you know, drugs and sort of go, what is the, the issue? You know, they want to help people uh, and they do want to provide care or they want to get, you know, a good career. Uh, <laughs> but. Yeah, I think that that is a, a, a very key point. And I think, you know, when you do hear the sort of complaints from people of like, oh, the NHS this and they just treated them so badly on this ward or they treated them so badly there and they don't care. It's like, well, you know, they've got other issues that they have to deal with as well. You know, they're in a workplace and they've got targets to meet and everything else. It's like they need more resources. They need more time. And like you say, it's that lack of time. and you're providing a space to give that time and also that ear to someone because even if you're in family dynamics you're in a loving relationship um there will be things you know like when you said before 
that people might have held on for th to things for years and years and years. You know, sometimes it's discretion is the better part of valor. So you don't say anything, even though you should, because you think, well, this will just be easier. And then someone there providing that time for them to to sort of speak out and express themselves and sort of try out those ideas and say, you know, should I actually do something about that? I think that's a really, really valuable um, resource, I suppose, for want of a better word. In terms of of your uh, your clientele, I suppose the kindness festival, in a way, is is you kind of reaching out to to more people. Like you said, you know, you're having that bigger platform and to kind of get to more people, because obviously you're charging at a reasonable level for what you're doing, but that's not always affordable to everyone. Absolutely, and I think that you know if you speak to most people not most but certainly many of the people i know in the complementary health you know space and I, I know quite a few you know and again not just homeopaths but people practicing different things i think most most people would like to be able to offer to more people you know to make it a much more inclusive thing but at the end of the day i'm self-employed you know, and, and I have to balance the two things out. And, and many people have tried different projects, you know, and offerings and through, you know, through, through low cost clinics or, you know, whatever. Um, but, but it's challenging to balance both. I've got to be honest, Simon, it's, it's, it's not, this is not an easy career. You know, you wouldn't choose it if you wanted to make money. You know, I'd suggest people do many other things, not this. <laughs> so it is, it is vocational you know, because I feel strongly about it and, and I like to work with, with clients. So getting the message out about self-care, you know, almost trying to be um, preventative health care in a way is, is sort of, so, so before the Leeds, um, you know, kinder Leeds, there was a project called Leeds Mom, which was moments of mass mindfulness. Oh, and yeah, yeah. This was linked to a kind of a, a, a national thing. So I met, I, I have a little podcast called Sharing the Vibe, which again is about getting information out there about holistic health and well-being. And I met this woman through somebody else, and she was she had started this, the Moments of Mass Mindfulness, and the idea was to bring people together to meditate together. So it, it, you didn't have to be an experienced, med, you know, person who meditated, you know, or mindfulness. You would just be introduced to this and and share the experience in a group. So they did this in Nottingham, um, and then in the second year it was Nottingham and Bristol. Bristol had a small version, and so she was telling me about this project, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, we need to do this in Leeds. It's like, mm. Can I make this happen in Leeds? I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm going to ask my friends. So I brought in like a group of my friends and I said, would you help me? You know, and there was a, a yoga teacher and a mindfulness teacher, you know, and just like, because these are my friends. And we did that. And it was like a one day complimentary health festival in Kirkstall Abbey. And it was fantastic, you know. Oh, and it good was, location as well. <laughs> oh, it was the perfect location. You know, it was, there were so many things that just kind of went our way. And, and again, what we did was we had, you know, in, you know, a few yoga classes and we had Qigong and we had talks about nutrition and we had talks about, you know, just all sorts of things, you know, hey, things that interest me, but things that I want to introduce to people in a kind of very easy way, you know, where it's not seen as, oh, they're just a bunch of, you know, hippies or new age people or whatever, you know, they're off the wall. It's like, no, everybody can benefit from a bit of mindfulness, you know, mindfulness now, everybody's, you know, most people have heard of it, you know, even two years ago, you know, three years ago when we were planning this, you know, it was starting to be much more out there. And now it's like people understand that mindfulness can be really helpful, you know, so I think the more we can introduce those ideas to people and say, try it, see if it helps you, you know, don't, don't imagine that it's going to be easy first time because you've never done this. Why would you think it's easy? You know, it's not, it's not easy to do anything the first time you do it, but if you stick with it, you know, and try maybe the different, you know, there are different apps, there are free things, you know, there's all sorts of stuff, you know, particularly with the last year we've had where there are all sorts of resources online. My suggestion is always try a few things and see what fits, see what resonates with you and do that. And that might take you on a further journey where you start with mindfulness and then you realize, okay, well maybe my 
you know, what I'm eating isn't great. Maybe I need to look at that and maybe I, I need to, you know what I mean? And then you just start, it's all about self care and loving yourself. Mm. So, so sorry, this is a very kind of long and convoluted answer, no, it's great. you know, getting to, to the kinder Leeds festival just seemed like the next, the next kind of level of taking it again to a much wider group to looking at community and and being part of your community and you know what about a kinder business wow there are kinder businesses out there shouldn't we also be supporting those kinder businesses you know that to me that they, there should be more of them and there probably are more of them but i don't know about them and i want to know about them and for me kind of business is about not just how you treat your employees it's about how you treat your suppliers you know everybody forgets the suppliers <laughs> it's like um, so, you know, your suppliers, your customers, your, your employees, you know, are you walking your talk? You know, you, I've worked for companies who on paper look amazing on paper. They're brilliant. And then the reality of being there and how, you know, how I felt I was treated or others were treated was very different. So that's why I'm very much about walking my talk. Does that mean I'm perfect? No, absolutely not. You know, I have to work at these things. And like everybody else, you know, sometimes it's about acknowledging, oh, I could have handled that better. Mm. Oh, I shouldn't have been so short tempered in that situation. You know, when 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 I was first sort of linked to the Kinder Leeds Festival and we were driving around, my husband said, you're going to have to watch how you drive, you know, be, be careful because, you know, you have to be kind. And I said, yeah, I, you know, it makes me much more aware. And that doesn't mean that sometimes I haven't done something and I thought, oh, I should, you know, I wish I hadn't done that. Okay, I'm going to be better, you know, being more mindful of what I'm doing, mm -hmm. you know, and ensuring that I am aware of everybody around me. You know what I mean? Or not reacting to somebody who perhaps did something to me because it's that initial, that very quick, oh, yep. you're an idiot. How did you, you know, why did you do that? <laughs> And thinking, well, maybe they just weren't, you know, they weren't paying attention. I've done that, you know, where you've been in yeah. a roundabout and you just, so you lose your, your, you know, your attention for a nanosecond. Yeah. You do something and you think, oh, you know, that wasn't the right thing to do. So it's made me a much more compassionate person. That doesn't mean I have it all sussed out, but I'm very aware of it. Mm. And I, and I work to, to be more compassionate, be more kind in, in, you know, the opportunities that are given to me. Mm. I think the the thing you said about the supply chain though is very interesting, but I think that's kind of we're con we're trained and conditioned into that because you know we're all aware of the sweatshops and the you know the slavery overseas and all of the terrible terrible conditions, but it's also like cheap stuff. So I can't think about the terrible conditions because I want the cheap stuff. So it's very easy for you to set up a kind of like oh we're setting up a groovy business here. And then, you know, it's like, oh, we sell, we sell these t-shirts promoting like great things. And then they're all coming from some terrible sweatshop somewhere. I think that that's a very important thing to highlight. And that people, if they are being kind, you know, that has to pass all the way down, not just about, you know, you be nicer to your, your neighbors and the people that you want to impress. And that's what, one of the things that I think we, we don't realize sometimes the power we have as consumers, because we, we can choose to buy from one organization over another organization and and i do think you know or just even one local coffee shop you know and support like there's some brilliant independent coffee you know cafes around leeds who are doing amazing work and supporting all sorts of things you know we we interviewed some of them um as part of the kinder spaces um events last year and i was really impressed you know by some people and i thought i'm going to you know i'm going to make a conscious effort if i'm buying a coffee or something in leeds to go to those places and not go to the chains that i you know i i have issues with for a whole host of reasons do you know what i mean so it's like yeah. we have power to support organizations you know businesses people that are, are are doing the right thing or aspiring to do the right thing they may not have it all you know all done but they're assigned them they're shifting their culture to to do those things so we are very we have a lot of power and i don't think we use it <laughs> i think as well your your point about time sort of comes back into that as well because it's kind of like well i could research this company or i could find that but i haven't got time i've just got to get the thing yeah. and i've got to do the thing 
and you know you're you, you know from from our discussion you know i'm obviously a bit more agitated than you are and um, it, it 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 strikes me that it's kind of you're coming from more of a position of i have the time for this you know i i i've got time for this whereas i'm looking at the clock and seeing how long we've gone and sort of I, I, how much time do we need to cover and all of that so i'm i'm conscious of time um i did when we went into lockdown last year I was doing one of these 30 days of yoga things from from YouTube and I got into like I've not done 30 days yet. <laughs> I got about I think the longest I've got in a straight row was about 18, 20. And then, and it was difficult through there. But it, I did get to a point as well, because I'm taking that time for myself every day. I was just way more chilled out. You know, I had more time for everything else and I didn't feel like I had to sort of squeeze things in. I, it was. It, it's amazing how much difference and how much of an impact it does have just to slow things down because it doesn't need to be done now. If it needed to be done now, it'd be happening now. You know, it's that sort of urgent and important thing. Absolutely. Uh, do you do all your own social media for the business or do you sort of outsource that? Yeah, no, for me personally, I do, I do my social media, which is why I'm very hit and miss with it. Um, for Kinder Leads, we have um, a lovely communications, I'm not sure what she's calling herself, but she's our leader, you know, in, in our communications. She's young, um, she knows social media inside out, and that's, that's the challenge for somebody, you know, my generation is I'm always catching up and learning and don't really probably use it to the maximum, you know, I can, but I, but I do like it. I'm not, I'm not against it in any way, shape or form, but I use it. I, I just use it wisely. So mm. I use it, you know, I enjoy connecting with people. I mean, I connected with you, I think it was on Instagram. I noticed mm. you, you know, started following and saw your messages. And, and that's what I do. I look for people who are doing, you know, positive things who are either talking about leads in a positive way um, or are talking about, you know, things that I'm interested, holistic health, kindness, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, and I will, I will support people. I'll retweet, you know, I'm happy to, to be a platform to, to share these things because I believe in them. Mm. So, yeah, but, but I'm very hit and miss on it. And I'm, and I'm, I'm a bit kind of turned off by Facebook at the moment. And I don't know why I'm sort of less keen on Facebook <laughs> right now. I, I was not in love with Twitter for a long time and now I'm really into Twitter. You know, I can't explain why. <laughs> so I just kind of go through phases with different ones and, and just use them as and when. So if anybody's interested in these kinds of things, it's kind of, and I remember somebody saying to me, but you never promote yourself. And I'm like, well, I, you know, I, I promote things I'm interested in. And for me, that's, mm. that's promoting me. Yeah. If you follow me, you probably know what I'm interested in because I'm, I'm sharing, you know, things that other people do. And occasionally I'll share a photo of, of something that I'm, you know, I've done or I'm somewhere I've been or whatever. Yeah. I should be, you know, I should be sort of doing two things at once with my brain of like, I'm listening to you. <laughs> I should be thinking of the next question as well, <laughs> you know, just listening to you. Um, so how did you, you know, have you always been like this? Did you, were you a more turbulent person who had to really, really practice at this? Or was this something that you just kind of voted into and that's like, oh yeah, this is on my wavelength or? Hmm. I don't think I, I think if you ask my family, you know, I, um, <laughs> it's probably the, you know, my, my, my younger self was probably always quite, I kind of feel like I've always been quite reasonably balanced mm -hmm. in terms of, I, you know, but my, my sons will have seen me, you know, in high anger, frustration, you know, they've, but they've taught me a lot, you know, and I wish some of the stuff I know now I knew when they were, when they were little. Do you know what I mean? I think I could have handled things. There were a lot of things I wish I could have, uh, I would, I, I'd handled better. Mm. But they've taught me, you know, they and they made me become aware. And um, I think I've always been looking for ways of doing things, in, in, you know, in a better way. Maybe that's mm. it. I'm, I'm, I'm a curious person. You know, I want to learn about stuff. I want to make things do it in a better way because that feels better. You know, when I used to get very stressed out with them and shout and stuff, that didn't make me feel good. A, it usually didn't get the results I wanted. And B, it made me feel lousy, you know, mm. and I felt I felt rubbish. And I'd be like, oh, that was, 
you know, that was not the best, <laughs> the best example of motherhood, you know, and not that a mother needs to be a saint, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in that, but it's, it's just knowing how to handle things better, I think. Yeah. So I've always been curious in that way. Um, and I've attracted a lot of love into my life. You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I have a wonderful husband. You know, I have two kids who are now, you know, adults. And, and it's been fascinating to watch their journey. You know, when I was able to kind of take a step back and watch, you know, how they've evolved, you know, I think, okay, well, some of the stuff we've said seems to have had an impact, which is good, <laughs> you know, and, and they're their own person, you know, they're each their own person and, and finding their skills and their place in the world. And that's, that's an amazing experience to, mm. to witness that and be part of that. And I've attracted a lot of wonderful friends, you know, over the years. And because I feel I'm a good friend, I am a good friend. And therefore you attract, you know, kind of what, what you are. So the more, again, I put that out in the world, the more I attract that into my life. Mm. Um, and now working with the Kinder Leads team, you know, I've tried to be the manager or the leader. Manager, I, manager is such a boring word. I really don't like the word, so I resist it. But <laughs> to be the leader that I would have liked to have, mm. had, which I, I didn't really. I had, I had bits of it in different people. But, but never kind of in one person to sort of feel like, oh, you know, they're really doing it from the right place. I mean, it's much easier when you're working on a project that you have a, a strong emotional connection to that, you know, you mm. think is doing good for, you know, for the, for, for the wider um, world, really, you know. And I, and I do feel that about the festival because I think we're having ripple effects. It's not just about leads. We're starting in leads. We want... We want leads to, to be the kind of model of, you know, kindness and compassion. But the idea is, has always been for it to, you know, to go way out beyond leads. And we know that's having an effect because I've been contacted by different people in different places. So, mm -hmm. which is very exciting. You know, it's very mm. exciting to be doing that. I mean, just the idea of it, the idea of having a, a festival for kindness. It's like, oh, that's radical. <laughs> Let's it all go be nice to each other. <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah. sure if there was a festival of hate, the tickets would be really expensive and there'd be <laughs> lots of sponsors for it. But <laughs> Well, we think, you know, it, it, and, and that's the thing. It seems to capture people's attention and, and, and they like it. And then, and then when I say to people, well, actually, Leeds is a really kind place already. I've seen it, you know, being being the project leader, I learn about different groups and organizations and they may not be the, the you know, the sexy, you know, charities or whatever. They, they may be working with a small group of people in in a in a part of Leeds that, you know, many people don't go to, but they're doing their bit and they're making a difference there. And that's what I want everyone to know about, because once you know that and you think, there are all these amazing people across Leeds doing incredible work who really care and are very dedicated to whatever they're doing. And not all of them are paid for it. You know, many of them are not paid. They're doing it mm. on a voluntary basis because they want to make a difference to their community, or, you know, whatever. That, again, just just raises your, you know, your your vibration, your energy. You think, wow, our, our city is kind. Is it perfect? No. Is there a lot still to do? Of course, there, there, there is a lot still to do, but we have a lot to be proud of. Mm. And that in itself will, will ensure that, you know, wherever we have forgotten somebody or something or something's not been looked at, that'll start making people aware and think, actually, we need to do something about that. Who, who wants to, who's going to do something about that? How can we get somebody to do something about that? As well, and I think this is related again to time pressures, you, you know, awareness is key. So I, I lived in London for a few years. I remember when I was down there and they started putting those, I don't know if you would have been here at this point, but they started putting the notices on the buses with the little cartoons of like, don't take up two seats, be nice. You know, how about, it's like, oh, well, that's a silly thing to do, but it isn't at all. I think those public service announcements are really, really vital of just to kind of remind people because not everybody, you know, there's this assumption that, like with common sense, that even something as simple as like people being able to, you know, wash and clean themselves, 
Like not everybody knows. You don't know unless you've been taught. Not everybody's been taught. And once you, the the thing that you learn in society, like for example, if your if if your literacy is poor, you learn how to hide it. That's what you learn. You don't learn to read. You learn how to hide these things, and then they build in their own problems. I sh- I need more questions. <laughs> Just sort of having a conversation. <laughs> well, let's um. Let's discuss well-being for a bit because I've I've had a couple of conversations about well-being recently and it is very much um it's kind of a corporate buzzword and there's kind of this sort of you know as as executives whether they be in silicon valley or wall street have kind of got into oh the benefits of meditation or 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 the, whatever it is there's a level in, in that it's become fashionable within certain circles so what's your 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 take on sort of wellness and and corporate interactions with these sort of ideas uh, and how far they take those because to me it's a lot of you know this is this is fine for our management but we're not going to give it to the people in the call center yeah which which again is kind of the you know it's back to walking walking the talk if you want your employees to be well you have to create an environment where they feel valued, where they feel, you know, I'm not sure, you know, everybody expects to be absolutely equal. And I don't know that necessarily everybody wants to be, you know, because you have to understand when, when, when you're in those management positions, you know, that comes with a lot of responsibility. So, you know, that's what you're, you're exchanging. So I've been, I've been on all those levels. I've worked, you know, from, you know, when I've, when I've been a student and working as a messenger in a, you know, in a law firm, you know, or, or working in a health food store, or, you know, so I've done all sorts of jobs, but it's more how you feel valued as a human being, that you are an important part of this whole, this whole kind of system. So, yeah, I'm, I'm always a little bit, a question when, when things become kind of corporate speak and it's like, okay, well, what are you actually doing? What are you doing on a day-to-day basis to make your employees feel valued so that they feel well, you know, because if they're struggling at home with some kind of major issue, you know, and they're trying to work, they're trying to do their thing, but it might impact their work. How, how do you support them? What, what sort of things do you, do you offer that might be able to support them? Um, I think it goes back even further to, to like schools, you know, we, there was like a health and well-being week at my son's primary schools, you know, years ago and introducing the idea of meditation with children and children take to it like that. Mm. Children don't have any of these. What am I doing? What is this? Why am I doing there? You know, all the chat, they don't do that. They just take to it like that. And if you could introduce it at that stage so that it's not something weird or different or whatever, mm. then people follow through with that and explore other avenues. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I think organizations, if they really care about the wellness of their employees, they need to look at what kind of environments they have created and whether people feel a sense of being valued and have the opportunity to maybe, you know, have some support systems when they're going through something difficult, because inevitably, they're going to go through something difficult because we all go through difficult things. Mm. And I guess that's one of the things, you know, another message is, you know, nobody has the perfect life. I mean, whatever you see on Instagram or Facebook, whatever, Mm. nobody has the perfect life. Nobody has ever had a completely perfect life. They're carrying baggage from the past or they're, you know, or they're dealing with something and it looks, in fact, the more perfect it looks from the outside, Mm. usually the more that's going on, behind that because there's some level of compensation of I need to look perfect I need to make sure this is all perfect Mm -hmm. so so yeah so offering employees you know either somebody to speak to or or opportunities to be introduced to things like you know mindfulness or you know yoga qigong I mean yoga it's funny like I'm a big I've been doing yoga for many many years and I've done it on and off for many years and 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 like you I've done the 30 days and you know, over this time, I've, you know, again, I've kind of gone into it, you know, and then drop it for a few days, because you get involved in something else, and then you come back to it and what have you. But I'm a big believer in yoga. And a good friend of mine the other day, she said, Gloria, you're not going to believe it. She said, I'm I've started doing yoga and I like nearly fell off my chair. This is not somebody who's ever done yoga in her life. And I'm like, really? She's like, she's like, yeah, and I'm really enjoying it. And I'm like, you know, 
these are just things you can try without any pressure, without any, you know, just try them and see, see what it feels like. So companies need to walk their talk. If they're talking about this, you know, they should be held accountable as to what they're doing and who they're offering it to and making sure that it should, you know, managers should have it, yes, but so their they're, they're employees, because that's their backbone. If their employees are well, they will do well. Mm. It's not rocket science, is it? You know, you're depending on all these people who are on call centers, who are having conversations, and I'm the, I'm the person on the other end ringing them. And if I get, like, not treated well, I'm going to be like, hang on, why, why am I buying this from you, this service from you? Mm. Whereas if I feel like I'm valued as a customer because this employee is valued as an employee, that's a very different experience as a consumer. And mm. I'm more likely to tell people, hey, I had a, you know, it was actually okay. You know, that, that, that call service, you know, that call center experience was okay. It was fine rather than, oh, I'm just a number. Nobody cares. And because they're feeling that way. Mm. So that has led to me thinking of a question that is actually work related. So I'm thinking about your workspace. So I'm imagining that, you know, you have a home office and that's, that's where your practice is. Is, is that right? Um, I have a home space. Um, I practice, I have practice from um, clinics traditionally mm -hmm. is what I've used. I have used my home. I prefer not to use my home. So I have used rooms in other clinics. Mm -hmm. um, during this period of lockdown, I've used Zoom a lot more, um, mm -hmm. which is fine. Um, it's obviously not, it's not the same. Um, and it has its pros and cons, you know, like anything. So I wouldn't want to be exclusively Zoom. I do like to see people and particularly my older clients. I like to see them. So anyway, long answer again. I, can't I think, I think you need the presence as well, though, don't you? Because you can see a person, but you know you cannot replace that actually being in a room with someone especially when you're you know when your your work and your business is kind of being attuned to their their energy for want of a better expression like you can only get so much of that from from video you know you you, you don't get any of the atmosphere of the person i don't think you get the look yeah you can get some things um yes and I think it, it helps if you already know them. So many of my clients at the moment I've I've met before. So, but but the new ones I haven't necessarily. But what it does, I guess, is it makes you tune in differently. So you're having to pick up information, you know, slightly differently through a screen than you would do if you're present with somebody. But I do miss, you know, particularly some of my older clients. Um, I'm, I'm lucky to have some really lovely older clients and I like being with them, you know, and, and, and they enjoy that time again, you know, one-on-one -on -one of just some support and being heard. So yeah, it's, it's not perfect, but it's good. You know, it's good and it's okay. And it's allowed me to continue, you know, supporting my clients during this time. And and the online thing, certainly for the festival, well, we wouldn't have had a festival. It's as simple as that. If had, had we not been able to do it online, it wouldn't have happened. So it, it ended up being a positive thing in terms of reaching people and perhaps people we wouldn't have reached otherwise. Mm. Yeah. But do you think, do you think the ideal would be to have, to have both? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm not sure we would have got there, you know, without having to be forced. You know, Simon, if you if you'd asked me a year ago what Zoom was or, you know, a little over a year ago, I had no idea what Zoom was. I never used Zoom. I did use Skype. You know, I've used yeah. with my family. But but in terms of organizing a meeting, you know, with multiple people and all that, I mean, I had no I, I had no experience of that. So so it forced us to do it. Um, and I think that was a positive thing because we all had to learn. <laughs> I'm no expert, but I can do it. And. And then, you know, and, and people had some positive experiences from it. So I, I, I see it as, you know, as a good thing. I'm not, I'm not anti-technology. I think technology has a place. It shouldn't replace, but mm -hmm. it has a place with things. So, so yeah. So yes, that to me, this, this the one in October. So our new festival will be, we moved it to October. Mm -hmm. We want more 
schools and places of learning to be involved. So doing it at the beginning of September doesn't really give them enough time. So we've moved it to October and also to give us the best, hopefully the best possibility of having face-to-face, -face, some face-to-face -face events and some online. Excellent. We keep sort of mentioning the Kindness Festival, but we haven't really gone into it. So let's, let's actually sort of break that apart a bit and, and sort of cover the backstory. So we I know a little bit about how it sort of came together. Was that just straight off the back of the, the mass mindfulness thing? Was it sort of the following year or how did you come to that idea and then go through the process? Because I imagine in the process that you would have been planning this at the beginning of last year you'd already be in the stages and then the pandemic hits there must have been the crisis moments of like we can't do this so just sort of take us through that so the idea really is from from two of the co-founders so i'm not one of the co-founders so this this idea was brewing well i guess now it's almost three years that it was brewing way before the pandemic way before anything and it started with a conversation between two of them about what would a compassionate city look like. So the words used to begin with were very much about around compassion and well-being. And one of the things they decided is that in a, in a compassionate city, you would celebrate that. So what's the best way to celebrate? We'll have a festival. So I was busy working on the Leeds mom, didn't know about this at all. And what happened was somebody introduced myself and another member of the Leeds mom team to a member of the what was then compassion and well-being festival and we we had it you know we met for a coffee and we knew we were on the same page so what happened is they joined our bandwagon participated in in the Leeds mom to kind of start talking about what they were doing what they were really great at is having open meetings so open meetings like anybody who's interested come along and be part of this. So I went to an open meeting afterwards because I thought, well, I need to know more about what they're doing. And at this, this was more like an event. It was like a day event. And um, at this meeting, and we were all talking about, you know, stuff and, and what came out was kindness. So the word kindness sort of started coming out. And then somebody said, oh, well, we're part of this kindness revolution. And we all turned and looked at her and we were like, wow yeah that is what we're doing that's what this is about so suddenly kindness needed to be part of the title which is why we have such a very long title the leeds festival of kindness compassion and well-being shorthand kinder leads um, so that's kind of how it how it came about and then how i got introduced and then because the the co-founders had seen me um help deliver the leeds mom you know, from nothing really. And with my with my team there, they asked me to join and lead the team to do this. So so that was very exciting because again, I, it was about, okay, I'll, I'll create a team, you know, of, of, of the people who have sort of expressed interest, but really want to be the boots on the ground to get work done because I'm a very practical person. So while mm. I you know, I, I, I can be creative. I'm actually very, okay, how do we ground this? You know, these mm. ideas are great, but what are we going to do? You know, what happens mm. in order to get there? Um, so that's how I came into it. And then, you know, people stepped forward. I asked, so the, the woman who, who's, who expressed those words of kindness revolution, it's like, you have to be on this team. So I waited for her. She went traveling and came back. And as soon as she came back, I pounced on her. And I said, I'd really like you to join. And she's still part of what we do. So, you know, it was it was about finding the players who would who would help create something and, and, and we put some themes around it. And so. Then it's about bringing in other organizations, because this was never about us creating loads and loads of events. This was about us kind of being the umbrella mm -hmm. organization, us creating some events and then other groups doing their own events. So let's mm -hmm. say, you know, there's a weekly group, um, you know, of. I don't know, older people who meets in, you know, Holbeck or Cookridge, you know, every week, that week, they could do something around kindness, you know, whatever that is, you know, they could, mm -hmm. they, I don't, I don't know, they can, you know, just do an activity or just focus on the word or whatever they want to do, yeah. or do, you know, mindfulness, whatever. 
um, but be part of the festival in that way. So that way it wasn't about us doing loads and loads of work, but actually using the resources around Leeds and the groups who are already doing brilliant stuff, but just getting the, everybody to focus on kindness, you know, that sh putting the spotlight on kindness for that week. So fast forward, yes, we're, you know, we're, we're busy creating all these things and, you know, really excited and what have you. And then of course everything gets shut down and we're like, okay, well, we're not sure how long this is going to be. Shall we just wait? Okay, let's wait. <laughs> so April, I think March and April, we were just kind of waiting to see, mm. you know, and, and one of our, our, our co-founders, he was saying, I think this is going to go longer. He was hearing stuff through, I don't know which channels. And he was saying, I think this is going to go for much longer than we think. Mm. So then it was about, okay, again, me being very practical. It's like, okay, we need to make a decision. Mm. You either move it to a different date or you change it or you mm. cancel it. And I was very much of, let's just change it let's make it different but start with something you know we put it out there that we wanted to start let's let's start with something and and that's when we decided yeah let's do it online okay right well now we need to organize completely different events <laughs> than what we were thinking you know and trying to get our heads around as to how that would work and we luckily we have a really brilliant it I think he wants to be called a tech guru, Nick, who's wonderful. And he helped us, you know, kind of literally holding our hands as to how we would do this, how we might do this. Yeah, I was impressed by the videos of the the, the, the mixing and how, like even that introduction one with Judith Blake coming in, you know, that she wasn't there already and that he, he brought her in. I mean, he obviously knows what he's doing with the, whatever software he's using. Because you see plenty of people online who are doing those kind of meetings and they're all over the place. <laughs> yeah, no, Nick, Nick Craig, I'm gonna, I'll give him a plug, Nick Craig Designs, he's brilliant and he, he's helped us. So he volunteered his time um, to, to support us. And he did it, you know, you want to look professional, you know, and, and sometimes we didn't look mm. professional, to be honest, not, not because of him, because of us, because some of the people, because some of the people, you know, hosting events, we weren't particularly tech orientated. So we try and do something and then it didn't happen or what have you, but he made us look a lot more professional, which, which was amazing. And, you know, that, that, you know, the fact that Judith Blake, was willing to be part of it, you know, was amazing. We've had a lot of support from Leeds City Council. Mm. And, and, you know, again, I've met some really good people who work there who are trying to make the city a much better place. So I have a lot more time for Leeds City Council now, you know, having met people mm. you know, who are not only supporting us, but just who have a vision of the, you know, the city and what they're trying to do. So we were very lucky with her and then um, Satish Kumar. I don't know if you had a chance to watch his talk, but I would say to anybody who's interested in what we're doing, his talk is probably the overview. It gives the best flavor of, of the, the purpose of the festival and how to incorporate these kinds of ideas into your life. Mm. Yeah, I, I didn't get that far into it, but I will go back and, and watch the rest. So, yes, so what I was going to ask there was, so I, I see on the, the website, you've got a breakdown of like kind of, kind, of in, kind of individuals, kind of groups, kind of businesses. What are the gaps there that you feel from that first year? So would it be, you know, I'm, I'm thinking like kind of suppliers, kind of schools, kind of, you know, what, what are the gaps that you see? Yeah, well, what's interesting is, you know, those themes have ser served us well last year and we're really right now we're in the kind of nitty gritty of how do we design it for this year? Does it need to be the same? Does it need to be different? And I think it, it will be slightly different, but some of the, the kind of the, the ideas coming through and this is back to we held an open what we call the design event on the 27th of February, inviting again anyone who wanted to be part of that. And we had some brilliant people turn up, you know, we, we had 40 people on our call, which was amazing. And some of the things that are coming through is about kinder food. So kinder food being how you grow your food, you know, in a sustainable way, how you, you know, what, how you buy food, how you share food, how you don't waste food, you know, so there's something around that. So, so we're looking at groups and organizations who want to do something maybe around food. Then there's kind of schools or kind of places of learning. I'm kind of calling it, I'm, I'm broadening it out because we, we'd love more schools to be involved, really want schools to be involved because I definitely think you start with, 
with youngsters and try and, you know, tr try and help them see how important it is to be kind to yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and not beat yourself up. And then that will help you become kinder to everybody else around you. And I think most kids, to be honest, most kids are kind of naturally kind. I mean, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they have, you know, yeah, yeah. unkind behavior. But generally, you know, the kids are good. I think most kids are good. And the ones who aren't, you want to see what's behind that. There's usually something behind that. There, there's a reason that, that there's there's something going on there. So work with the kids. And then we've had uh, interest from the universities, you know, from Leeds City College, from you know, from various because again mental health at, at that age is so important. And I think, I think if anything we've seen, you know, is everybody has had ups and downs with their mental health during this time, you know, myself included, I've had moments where I'm like, I have no idea when I'm going to see my family again. You know, mm. that, that's a pretty heavy thing for me. Uh, you know, I try and put it to one side and think I will see them again. I know I'm going to see them again, but you know, I haven't seen my mother for two years now. And it, you know, by the time I see her, it'll be two and a half, three years, something like that. Yeah. So everybody's had stuff. And I think a lot of young people who have had perhaps a lot of certain, you know, certainty in their lives, suddenly everything has become uncertain, you know, became uncertain, you know, and my, yeah. my, my son's included. So I've seen that with everyone. So if we support young people at that time, again, about self care, you know, and, and taking time out if you're feeling overwhelmed and, you know, what are the things, can I go for a walk in nature? Can I just sit and look, you know, I've got a beautiful tree here in my back garden, you know, look at a tree and connect with that and mm. try not to be overwhelmed and try not to spend all my time on, on the phone, which isn't feeding me, isn't nurturing me. It's making me feel bad about myself, you know, my mm. body, my whatever, my life. So places of learning is quite important. The other thing that's coming through is very much about arts and performance and crafts. So craft, craftivism and, and, and crafting, you know, again, has become a big thing this past year and everybody finding their kind of creativity and playfulness. So I don't know if you, you know about um, Love to Play 2021. This is Emma Bierman's um, kind of campaign in Leeds. So this is happening. Yeah, yeah. So we're doing, we're trying to support that because being playful as an adult, A, often isn't a natural thing for us to do, <laughs> but B, the more playful we are, the more, again, that raises our energy. So, so I had a conversation with them a couple of weeks ago and it was really interesting because it made me start thinking about how I played as a child and what things I was interested in. And, and inevitably you start smiling, you start thinking, oh, I used to do that. And I I really enjoyed doing that. God, I haven't done that for, you know, I haven't even thought about that. I can't even remember what that game was called, you know, mm. all those kinds of things. So, so, so there's something around performance, theater, art, creativity, playfulness, craft, something in that kind of space. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think, and, and self-kindness will always be the foundation of all of this. So, you know, whether it's any of those things, self-kindness, is key. So even about food and how we, we feed ourselves, you know, and what we feed ourselves, what we choose to feed ourselves. And hey, is that is that a good thing? You know, is that really helping me? Or have I made a conscious decision today to have a brownie, which is my my, you know, kind of weakness. <laughs> but I'm okay with that. Like I've chosen today and I'm gonna enjoy it and I'm not gonna worry about it and and let it go, you know. So mm -hmm. so I think the self kindness thing relates to all of them. But it's still, we're still defining it. And the, the core team, we meet every Wednesday. Tomorrow we want to kind of pin it down because we have to communicate it to everybody now. And that's when people will, you know, people are already saying, oh, we're in, we're on board, we're gonna do something, you know, we're, you know, and we want people to feel like it's, it's, it's theirs, that they have the freedom to create their own thing. So it doesn't have to be, you know, there aren't these kind of strict rules that you have to do, but we need to know who you are and what you're about, because we need to make sure that whoever is kind of saying they're part of us, you know, are kind of aligned to what we're talking about. Yes, indeed. And as mentioned in my intro, I also need to know who is listening and what the heck you make of this. Next time on Working Hours, we're talking numbers as I'm speaking with an accountant. 
We cover a lot of ground in that interview, so please do come back for it. Also, there are still 10 episodes from last year's volume for you to explore, and the other great episodes from this year are also all available for free wherever you get your podcasts. Please remember to like, share and subscribe. If you're feeling it, why not become one of my first three patrons and thus become one of my favourite people ever? Be my guest on Working Hours. If you're in Leeds or from Leeds, then get in touch now. Email this podcast, workinghourspod at western-studios.com with a short bio and suggestions of your availability to be my guest or send your feedback, questions, comments and queries, whatever. Time for the rules. This is a rules-run local podcast for local people. The first rule of working hours is you must tell a loiner about working hours. The second rule of working hours is you must like and subscribe to the show. The third rule of working hours is that if you are a loiner, then be my guest. The fourth rule of working hours is take ownership of your work. Agitate, educate, organise and get to democratise in your workplace. What do you do, Leeds? Tell me about it. Go to western-studios.com for more information or just email workinghourspod at western-studios.com with a brief bio and some suggestions regarding your availability. Please let me know if you would wish to be anonymous on the show. If you would like to take part but you don't want to be identified, then you can send me a secure email to westernstudios at protonmail.com. Don't want your interview published right away? Fine, we can do that. You will have approval on what gets published from your interview. You can follow this show on Twitter at Western Studios 2 and on Instagram at Western underscore Studios underscore Leeds. You can support the show with a one-off donation either to Kofi, that's K-O hyphen F-I dot com forward slash working hours or via buymeacoffee.com forward slash Western Studios where you can give as much or as little as you like. If you'd really like to help out, then you can give the show regular support and help build the project and help us in meeting the goal of lasting out this decade. Subscriptions for Loiners are a pound a month. Go to www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash working hours pod to become a regular supporter. If you're not from Leeds and you would still like to support this show, you can join the Outlander level for five pounds a month. That's it. Now go do one amazing thing today. Working Hours podcast is made by Western Studios Leeds Limited. It is presented and produced by Simon Treen. This interview was recorded over Skype. Thank you to Captivate.fm for podcast hosting. The Working Hours theme was provided by Australian-based loiner DJ Punk. You can hear more from Punk at soundcloud.com forward slash big time punk. If you're in Leeds and have a podcast idea that you would like to develop, please email makemypodcast at western-studios.com with some details about what you would like to achieve and let's start making your podcast a reality today. Follow Western Studios on Twitter, Instagram and linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western-studios for sporadic news on new episodes of Working Hours and for new original podcast productions that will be coming soon from Western Studios Leeds.